Hello and welcome to episode 55 of Taste My Game Face. I am your host, Azizi Adiemo, joined today by Joe Knight. Hi. Wayne James. Hello. Alan Heath. Hello. And Daniel Slauson. Hello. Sorry, that was, like, I, that was insane. Doing, having that going on while I was sitting here and not just have it on in the edit. I so, was so, 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 so for the first time, we've actually got it so that we've got all of the kind of uh, sounds that are going on happening live. Um, and I'm watching Wayne's face like whilst the intro music was playing. was It was something beautiful. He was, he was caught in this massive desire to start cackling. He was holding his hand over his mouth, holding in the passion for this beautiful video game podcast that you're now listening to I think he's trying to control us with the gong noise I think it's oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it works it works uh, son it's of gonna a be bitch Pavlov. I'm gonna be going to be going for dinner every time he brings that fucking gong <laughs> Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, this is another episode of Taste My Game Face. If you like our podcast, it'd be really good if you could recommend us to a friend um, or review us on iTunes. That's always helpful as well. We'd like to get a few more people listening. So if you think we're good, tell other people about us. That that goes a long way. Um, so we, we're, we're all about positive affirmation. So, like, you know, ringing bells or, you know, writing signs, hiring planes to go over, you know, our part of London. I've heard or that one's email really us. successful, that game. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. Particularly if you want a manager ousted. Oh, football joke. <laughs> Uh, not following at all <laughs> like at all um, if you do want to get in touch with us you can email us at tastemygameface at gmail.com as well though so if yeah if you want to say something you know nice or tell us that we're all a bunch of horrible people and we should stop making this podcast you know where to reach us um, and we've got a website at tastemygameface.com too so with all of that out of the way um, I I love Wipeout as you may know already dear listener I've gone in on how much I love Wipeout. We've been talking about future races for the last few episodes. Um, Wayne, you have been playing the Wipeout Omega Collection as well. So I, what do you think? I have. I, um, I've come into this from the other side of you. I, I did download HD Fury at some point, but never really gave it the time that I think it deserved now in retrospect, and instead played um, 2048 a lot on the Vita mm -hmm. um, and 2048 was just out of the gate exceptional so right? 2048 is the version that came out after um, the the ones on the PS3 yes so it, it was there was was it a launch title or close yeah, to it, really it for the PS Vita, the Vita. It, yeah. it almost got me to get the Vita yeah like, um, I was, yeah I mean, like, but as as clearly fantastic as it was, as well put together as it was, the the software was more powerful or asked too much of the hardware to an extent. So loading times were an embarrassment. Yeah. So Literally, so the game was good, but you yeah, had to wait forever to be able to play it. Exactly. And having that disappear and being able to play through 2048 without that is the first magic sort of in. Because now I'm like able to sit down and my half hour gaming time, my 45 minute gaming time, I get more than three races. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, like, um, so yeah. Um, I guess there's only already... so much tea that one man can drink. Yeah, exactly. I, oof, I went through so many but, you, know, you, you can play the Vita on the toilet though, so you can just carry it passing through. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> one man, his kettle, his Vita, his toilet, just locks it there for an evening. I, I know what I'm going to be spending my evening doing. <laughs> Should I, um, I get my one disappointing bit out of the way of it? Yeah, go for it. My one disappointing thing about it is that they've not integrated it together i expected actually a combined package and actually what i've got is the previous games next to each other so i quite like that i think i think the fact that it's um not studio liverpool doing it means that instead of taking um the old games and trying to fit them together in a way that might not represent the spirit of wipeout as much they've just gone look we've got these three excellent games so we'll give you all three of their campaigns in the same package. So yeah, if you when you're going through the menus of the game, you can play either the Wipeout HD campaign or you can just scroll over to the right of that and there's the uh, Wipeout Fury campaign or the first one that appears to the left of the HD campaign is the 2048 campaign. And yeah, that works yeah. for me. 
I mean, it, it works. It certainly does. But the thing is that, like, because of the way that the grades, the difficulties ramp up, you sort of like you feel like you want to play one of those boxes in completion. So you get to sort of crazy expert level on twenty forty eight, for example, and then you move over to HD, and you're starting, and you're starting again. at the beginning that's true, again. That's true. So there's there's, but that aside, I mean, I I can find little more to say about Wipeout, but just how much fun I have had. Like I've I've never gone as in on a wipeout game as I have as like having them all next to each other, and I am playing races time like again and again and again, constantly going to restart, looking to shave that extra like five hundredths of a second off, the, and it has been as close as that to get an elite pass on oh, yeah. the time trial, <laughs> and you know, like sort of going like playing zones and getting perfect lap after perfect lap, and then ricocheting and bouncing backwards and forwards. There's, off that, the there's side. that hilarious thing that happens in wipeout, which is you you have control in your in your race line you're doing things perfectly and then you hit one wall but you're going too fast to be able to correct from hitting the next wall and then you're just bouncing from wall to wall to wall until you explode yeah so I, I've done a lot of that but it, one thing that's like it never ceases to be fun every every issue is your fault I mean that's something that I've never really appreciated about Wipeout before yeah. how responsible you are for what happens and it- I think that's something that people really appreciate in all games like you know that when you're playing um, I think the, the one that comes to mind instantly is, is Geometry Wars the, yeah. the, the thing that was great about that game was that everything is so responsive like this was one of the first top down shooters um, the twin stick shooters in fact that like appeared on the Xbox 360 that made that a really popular genre again um, and the wonderful thing about it was that whenever you were playing you knew that when it went, when it all went wrong after you'd been doing amazingly for a long time you'd been in that flow state kicking geometry's ass um, and, and then you died you'd be like oh oh that was my fault for doing this thing wrong and you knew exactly what it is that you did wrong so you could improve yeah exactly and so there is that sort of like constant like honing of your own abilities constant learning of the tracks and like the lines as well one of the things another thing that I never really appreciated about Wipeout before is how atypical the racing lines are compared to your Gran Turismo's or your Forza's or something I don't understand so, them in other racing games I only play Wipeout <laughs> <laughs> so like I, I mean I'm, I'm very used to like the traditional like racetrack racing line and Wipeout doesn't give you that mm-hmm. and I mean like don't get me wrong I was always I, I I think in my previous experiences of Wipeout, I've just kind of thrown myself around the track doing it and just enjoying it for what it was. Playing it for a good few hours and like really getting into it has made me really appreciate like the sort of nuances of the handling and the nuances of the racing lines that, yeah, they give you like a sort of deeper appreciation and make you feel, I guess there's a real achievement in working those out certain things that you come out time and time again and end up bouncing off of the walls and then one like one run through you get it and you realize that it was never that hard to begin with yeah and there's something i mean it handles in the way that it should it's it is a game about like these anti-gravity vehicles and they do slide round corners the way yeah. anti-gravity vehicles would and the, things like air brakes and, and, and stuff like that changing that are more effective when you are going faster as well. Yeah. Like it fits. It it has it has its whole own feel and it all feels right. But it says as much about the handling and the way that the the sort of like the arc it's not almost it's almost like a kind of it's like cross between arcade and sim, but it says as much about the quality of the track design as it does about and there's I don't believe there's a single disappointment. So I mean this is something that I really love about twenty forty eight. The fact that the that they've changed the the kind of design philosophy between H D and twenty forty eight. Yeah, part of that was making the tracks wider, which seems like it should be such a minor thing, but it allows for so many other ways of making your way through the level. It gives you more reactivity to what's going on. Like there is a racing line, which is the fastest, but also if somebody's put mines on the racing line, yeah, you've, you've got, got an different ways of getting around. You've got ways it, yeah. of getting around it, and you don't have to rely on just having cannons or something to dig yourself mm-hmm. out of trouble. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, like all of the modes as well. Like there are. A ridiculous number of modes on HD Fury like there are, there's a good number of modes on um, on 2048 but switching to the HD Fury thing it seemed like for the first um, campaign everything was giving me this new tutorial you've got this zones detonator sort of thing where you get faster oh God, and faster and you've got that for so long. mines to shoot down and like you've got a, and uh, if you go over boosts instead of getting 
um, launched faster, you pick up like this EMP, which when you launch it, clears a bunch of these mines from around you. So there's an idea of, and they're not always in the best place. Like sometimes getting one to boost your EMP is going to make you le- more likely to hit a subsequent mine. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, there's, so there's a kind of... <laughs> choice that you're making between making things more difficult for you in one way or more difficult yeah, in another exactly yeah. um and there's also the zone battle scenario yeah which i haven't played in in this new version so it's been a long time since i've had a go at zone battles so um to be clear zones is game type that i've been talking about before on the podcast where you just get faster and faster and you don't have a choice about it so it's you're getting faster you get you achieve more by managing to survive to a certain speed but as it gets faster it's more and more easy to just end up plowing into the side of the track and just losing all of your health and eventually exploding but it looked gorgeous <laughs> so zone battles is basically eight cars doing it at once mm-hmm. so ev- everyone gets faster and faster as they progress in the track but also if you use um a boost like you build up energy by going over speed boosts and if you use um, that energy it zips you through a number of zones obviously the higher the zone you're on the There's faster something you're going that, though. it zips you through a number of zones oh, and, and it a leaves shield a shield behind, behind you. you and if you hit that shield you slow down and you lose a lot of health yeah. So there's a kind of multiplayer version of this zones thing that's also into the in the campaign. It's quite good. It's quite good. But I think the kind of flipping design choices between HG and 2048 like means that I'm enjoying the 2048 stuff more. The fact that they now don't just have um, weapon pads where you get something at random that you get to it, that some of them are defensive ones and some of them are offensive ones. Yeah. That I think that's a really good thing. I, um, I, I, you know, I was telling you earlier when we were playing. I think broadly the aesthetic, even though the it's not quite as rich visually, I think the aesthetic for twenty forty eight, the UI and stuff, just appeals to me a lot more as well. I'm finding that when I play non campaign, that's where I'm going because it. I, I don't know. There's just something about it. I don't know if it's lighter or if it's just a little bit that there's not so many like signs and crowds around you. It feels a little it's bit, a bit pure more grounded, and closer to the track. Yeah. Grounded, yeah. Um, I mean, the complete neon insanity of like HD and Fury look gorgeous it's in this new version. They really, really do. But I do definitely appreciate the change in aesthetic as well. Um, I really like the fact that in 2048, like uh, the vehicles that there are less teams but there are multiple vehicles for the teams yeah so you can kind of specialize for different event types a bit more but still race with the team that you i don't know for whatever unnecessary you do get, I, I mean i've been trying to get out of that weird affinity thing so that i can try and use the best car for it but it does still feel weird from time to time i moving. still haven't unlocked any of the piranha vehicles and i want them all so much because that brazilian team is obviously the best they're pretty good they are pretty good i mean they're always my go-to in hd because they're the first unlocked speed car mm-hmm. in hd and they're yeah proper quality but yeah so so it's still good anyway oh, wipeout's yeah. still fantastic i mean like the one thing Ethan? that i sorry i was just gonna say have, have either or both of you been playing online much or have you been mainly doing That's... the offline stuff literally where i was about to go actually the um (laughs) what i was gonna do was put a call out for people to play online because i've gone to play online and i've got maybe four or five lobbies to choose from with you know a few races in one of whom is always ridiculously good most of whom are like me and are just getting into it and therefore so you've got i'm always caught between those two i am <laughs> i am like i'm racing miles behind the person that's like obviously does nothing but wipe out and never has done anything but wipe out but miles in front <laughs> of everybody who's just working things out so i'm just there on my own going oh this is a nice view <laughs> <laughs> see i i'm in that <laughs> cluster i'm not i'm not dropped off the back i'm in that cluster that's not the guy that's that knows it Mm -hmm. um so yeah like a call out to anyone if you if this seems like your vibe or if you've loved wipeout before get on it play it online because i want someone to play against yeah and and i i I, i've been really really enjoying the online as well um so interesting thing for me is like the last time i jumped on online um one of these insane wipeout experts had like decided to set up a lobby that was um the fastest speed track on a map in uh 2048 which doesn't have any sides that's like miles up in the sky called sol it's an amazing track it really (laughs) is um the tracks are wide so it's 
hopefully possible for you to not come off the side. But on the fastest speed class, that's pretty goddamn tricky. I hadn't played this level before, and I was like, yes, this is what a wipeout is for. I am going too goddamn <laughs> fast, and at certain points there are ramps that are leading off and you have to like find you have to aim yourself back at the track again afterwards like because because you've gone flying so ridiculously far away from the track that if you want to manage to well just not be reset further back you have to find your way back on course and like doing that going too quickly with other vehicles around you that you might be bumping off of or might be shooting in with weapons is so adrenaline inducing that yeah I was I was <laughs> having the best time possible um then this is the first time i played it i just i just about managed to come third <laughs> then wonderfully i came across that particular level in the campaign because i'd already been playing it too fast playing it on a slightly lower speed class i was actually capable of doing incredibly incredibly well on it so yeah jumping <laughs> in at the deep end sometimes it pans out sometimes <laughs> sometimes it really doesn't sometimes you just drown <laughs> sometimes you just drown not this time though not this time <laughs> but hey but yeah it's it's superb and like I mean, we've been we have been talking a lot about future races on the podcast lately. We've had grip to get into as well, and I think the more of them that we have, like up to a point, the happier we are if we can play them all. Um, talking of which, I've now purchased grip as well. Oh, I haven't you played have? it yet, but it was it was on sale in the Steam sale, and I wasn't going to miss out on that. Okay, awesome. So, no, it'll be good to come back to that perhaps yeah, in like a yeah, month yeah. or two when the track roster's built out a little bit more, and yeah. I'll be ready I to have. Give you I, I still have high hopes. I still have high hopes. No, me too. There's definitely. There's definitely looking good. I'm just waiting for the, mm-hmm. the meat on the bones, as it were. Mm-hmm. Um. So, Wipeout's a game with excellent music, but House Mark games always have excellent music as well. So, why don't you tell us about Next Machina as well? So, Next Machina, elevator pitch first as ever. Um, yeah, you don't, of course. Um, one never needs to say much more actually about Housemark games than it's a Housemark game. But for those that have never played a Housemark game before, um, it's a twin stick shooter. Um, and so that is you move using one the left stick, you fire using the right stick. There's no fire button in this one. Literally just... I, 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 I tend to prefer them like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I a mean, little bit of Detonation extra... did have a good reason for doing that, though. Mm. I mean, like no, no, no. When they it. when they have it, when they yeah. when they require you to use the trigger, there's always a good reason. But it's just a little bit of a flow that feels like it's lost in having to do that. If you yeah, why. no, so for it's sure. It's picking up the control pad thing, isn't it? It's like you pick up the control pad. You've got the two sticks. You push forward on one, and then the next one you push is. Yeah, like there's something satisfying about that. Totally, totally. <laughs> so, um, but this, well, it's like. Um, Next Machina, um, you come into it, you you load it up, you press arcade mode, you it says it goes to it gives you the difficulty selection screen and it says um, rookie, ex- experienced and then expert or something like that. So it's like got yeah, you're and then it's got a locked super you are the boss difficulty, which I am a long way from getting to. <laughs> um, and you know how you know most people that are fairly familiar with games particularly games by a specific publisher will um yeah will jump straight in on the at least medium or like yeah, the second one down it says on rookie this is where you'll be spending most of your time yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh so, I, I no i'm like i always like it when there's like a little thing with like each of the difficulties anyway yeah but like so, it's good when mm. they go yeah like the the what we say is the easy difficulty is not easy so the reason why i jumped halfway through the elevator pitch the experience of switching it on and selecting it is because you do that you select it and then there's no tutorial Oh. There's no, there's no, there's not even the buttons flash up on the screen as we're so used to these days. Even, and the reason why they can get away with that is because all the other house mark games that I have played so far felt like training for next <laughs> Machina. It's like I have been warming up for this experience for my entire house mark gaming life. Um, so it's, um, it's. Um, you are running around on level, so it's like a kind of foot based one. It's got nice match. Um, isometric ish perspective because um, I know that we had there was a sort of semi debate yeah, about yeah, what yeah. that term meant a little while ago so I'm not going to fully commit to that it's, it's, it's some angle that we're looking at <laughs> yeah exactly mostly above so um, yeah and so the le- the levels are fair you know can be fairly cramped can be fairly open there's a sort of variance they're not all a standard shape etc and then different 
and then enemies will come at you in the manner of a bullet hell so you get flocks of uh, like walking style enemies you get ones that can shoot at you you get ones that are a little bit heavier and chase after you and then so the the sort of bullet hell element gives me that sort of vibe of super stardust that twitch that looking for the gaps etc then you've got the and then you've got the sort of like varying enemies the walking element of it etc the different power ups and choosing your power ups and stuff feels a little bit dead nation-y the sort of way of the the shape of the levels and stuff and then you've got that mm. um, and then they've introduced humans as well um, which is like from Resogun. Okay, what to save? Yeah, so oh, there are okay. little save little it, humans so wandering about that you also have to go and get. And so if you've played these three titles, <laughs> do you just know exactly what's going on straight out of the gate? It's, <laughs> it's like, like the culmination. Yeah, exactly. Of the, like three it's major dashes franchises. on. You're like, oh, well, I guess there's a dash on the left trick. There is a dash on the left trick. Of course, <laughs> there fucking is. Oh, the right, the right <laughs> trick is my power move. Of course it fucking is it's just that like everything is everything is just like a perfectly soundly tightly honed culmination of this history of house mark games um so am i am i right in thinking that this is like a a remake of of some other game or something like that um i don't believe it's a remake there's um they got um the they worked with the guy i should have really written some of this information down oh let's just but they, eugene, go anyway. eugene jarvis eugene jarvis yeah. That was it. And he's been, like, big in arc- the arcade scene for a while. He's got a lot of, like, you know, arcade history. But did he work on Defender, Dan? Is that... Yeah, I, I, I actually just got a thing up because I was trying to think what this guy's name was. So he worked on Defender, which is, like, the prime influence for Resogun, and then also Robotron 2084. So I think Robotron's, uh, like, a really big influence here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that was probably... But maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> maybe I'm wrong. You you just said Defender was more. So oh, no, no. I said I meant no, for Resogun. Defender. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. okay. Got you. Got you. Yeah. Um. Yeah. 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 So, um, I I don't know. Like, obviously, House Mark has this like love of old arcade games, and they're all about trying to give us a version of that for for the here and now. My main question about this game, though, is how many voxels are there? Voxels. <laughs> voxels. Like pixels, but 3D. Oh, oh, that's their next game that's coming out. Yeah, it's exactly. about that. What? But their but but their last one was too. Yeah, yeah. yeah Rezo Gun. Yeah, Rezo Gun was. was, no, their, was their last game was Alienation. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Rezo that. Gun was. That's no. like a spiritual successor to. You're talking about those sort of like crazy particle things that yeah, exploded yeah, yeah. everywhere. Yeah. The there. particles that exploded. Yeah, yeah. And they actually. It's not so. It's not so much about that. This oh, time. No, 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 no. It's I got thought, a, you know, if, that was House Mark's um, it feels House Mark? <laughs> yeah, House Mark. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like it's it's got a far purer arcadey vibe. It's, it's not like I mean, it's got a lovely aesthetic. It's got like a sort of almost anime esque sort of style to it, doesn't it? It's um I mean when hmm. I saw the trailers for it, like I was getting all these giddy little like reminiscent about the you know the treasure smops like smops yeah 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 like you're like I mean it's got a lot of feel of Ikaruga like, uh, yeah. to it as well does it have any of those mechanics because Housemark had that platformer right called Outland which let you kind of switch around it doesn't have any of those mechanics but what it wait sorry what, what do you mean what was the, what was the thing in Outland um, in, in out, um, like in Ikaruga you can switch to match the colour of the projectile so you can pass through it mm-hmm. and they made a pla- Housemark made a platformer called Outland last generation Mm -hmm. which was a uh, platformer that kind of looked like ancient wall art (laughs) you know like everything was like this kind of like neolithic wall art that sounds cool Um, but you're uh, you're silhouetted with like bright colours in the background yeah but you could change between red and blue to um, pass through different barriers on the fly you know so you drop your character down and it'd be like blue blue red blue and like you'd have to flip Mm-hmm. As you, uh, I as do you enjoy drop. those like polarity mechanics that are often in games. Like that, that extra little bit of like managing to think about making sure that you are set up right to take on the next thing. It's yeah. always yeah. It's just especially a, when you have to do it like a uh, million like, times a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. I, I may be wrong, but I think there might be something like that in their next game, which is coming out next month, called Matterfall. 
I think that yeah. might have something like that's that the, in that's it. The I, voxel I, party. I may be mistaken. <laughs> yeah. I know, but I thought all of their games were voxel parties. No, but on, maybe no, on, no honestly, what, watch a gameplay trailer of Marvel. It literally is about a man that can reduce things to voxels. <laughs> <laughs> like that, that, is, that is the game. So that's why it's called Metaphor then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Aptly named. That's a really good name for a game. Actually, to be frank, next Machina is as well. Yeah, yeah they could, they could, they, they, they've got good. no shit down. I like, like, because that's the thing, in their last game, like, um, like they did their alienation was one word, alienation. So they're quite good. Cool. Yeah. What, so, when, yeah. what is the context for this game? Like, with Resogun, you're like a weird spaceship rescuing people. Uh, like you know what? Hold on, Dad. I never, I actually never even thought of asking that question. I was just like, <laughs> it's, a, it's a house smart game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a, it's a, it's a you bright shoot, neon shoot, shoot, shooty thing. Yeah. Like, <laughs> why, why, why are we doing this, Wayne? <laughs> are we? Uh, is there a reason? Don't we just shoot shit? I mean, no, the advert, there is so actually like these people so on arcade cabinets. Like, there being, is, like, there is a vibe to it. Although that. That, that never happens, or at least it's not happened that I've seen. Oh, okay. none of that, none of that sort of like tradery stuff happens that I've actually seen so far. Mm. The only, the only indication of it is the sort of weird like machine thing that's the loading screen. That sort of, yeah, I won't, I won't deal with that. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, so it's, I mean, it's split into worlds. Well, yeah, so you're, I mean. The, the end the level start with you as a guy on a bike and that cutscene lasts for about a second and a half mm. and then he jumps off of the bike and starts shooting shit Tron and that's 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 <laughs> that there, there you go that's that's the what's the word like that's Self premise. Yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. premise. There we go. That's it. Man, <laughs> uh, right cool dude bike. on cool bike rides, jumps and, off and shoots everything yeah, with cool that's, guns. That's literally so that you know that you've not quite started yet. But there's <laughs> <laughs> there's a bunch of like there's a bunch of really neat things that are set inside it. So the humans, as it, as in Resogun, can be captured by certain enemies, and it sort of alerts you on screen when that's about to happen. And so if you want to get the best possible score, because it's a how smart game, so it's all about getting the best possible score you have to run the gauntlet and like take on all of these things as quickly as possible to get through and dash through a bunch of all of bullets and use your power shot and take out that thing that's trying to kill the human or if you get it right dash in grab the human from sort of out under it and then dash away again and shoot it as you run off which is also <laughs> times it's pretty so wonderfully like, swish so that they really like Add that pressure on, like they did it. Yeah, really exactly. That. That's really good. It's the, so I was wondering how that would kind, of, how they managed to kind of get that feel. So yeah, the pressure is definitely there, but there's also like a bunch of other stuff. There's like there's random bonuses, like the, there's visitors, which are um, they're like almost chains of things similar to like in Galaga. Oh, okay. Little strings of enemies that will run a certain route, and the route will be marked by a green line, so you know there's going to be visitors at some point. Oh, they did that in Resogun as well, didn't they? With certain yeah, they There'd did. Be a line that went. That yeah, came and down. if you do that entire line, you get a certain bonus. If you shoot certain aspects of the scenery, then in in very rare occasions there are bonus exits that you can go to, and mm. you can't get all of the humans and therefore the biggest possible bonuses without finding all of the secret exits. And all of this is happening in this really intense, and this is on Rookie. I've played it on Advanced as well now, um, whatever the second tier is called, I think it's Advanced, but I'll keep changing it, fine. <coughs> Excuse me. So yeah, um, even on Rookie, it's, fi it's constant, you're constantly under pressure. Um, particularly once you get off of the first world. The second you move to advance, that pressure is like heightened fivefold and remembering that there are secrets to obtain, let alone where they are and how to get them. <laughs> it's just, I mean, and the other little bonus that they've got that is so awesome, as you finish a level, you kill the last enemy and these two circles close in around your character. If you mm. dash, just as the circles meet, you sort of dash into the transition between the levels rather than just doing the transition you sort of dash into it and then you get a little noise and a bonus score yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. which plays to my river um... swishness bonus <laughs> but yeah no because I was going to say because because like it's the your love of the reaction games and this game and Wipeout it seems like they are all hitting that same thing of it being achieving like flow state look there's so much going on that being able to get things right to succeed you 
can't, you cannot be thinking about it. Yes, exactly. But all of your attention has to be on it, but you can't be actually consciously thinking about it. <laughs> exactly that. I mean, there are, the, the, there are, like, as you move to the advanced mode, the, so there is a boss to each world, and those bosses are even more traditional bullet hell than the main games. Mm -hmm. So the main games have, like, a real cluster of things going on, but all of the bosses use projectiles as their main way of you know trying to kill you so you have like I mean the most obvious one the, mo the one that's most reminiscent of like an Ikaruga style boss is the one to the second world which is actually called something Kong and it's this giant monkey thing um <laughs> Nice. But it's sort of like, yeah, exactly. It sort of hops along the top of the screen and it fires skull projectiles at you. There's lasers coming out of the side. There's like... <laughs> you do the concentric <laughs> waves. Yes, like the concentric waves. Wave. Within waves yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and, you've got, and you've got to like find the little gaps between them and then use your immunity dodge to get through like the like the circle that's completely unavoidable. Slightly pass out one. <laughs> yeah, <it>. exactly. <laughs> and so I was like... I was playing it and it was only, thankfully... When I finished the level, I realized that I no longer had a shield because you can pick up shields that give you one hit of immunity. Mm -hmm. And normally you want that when you're going into a boss. Yeah. I didn't realize I didn't have it until the last couple of bullets, <laughs> like the last couple of hits. And then suddenly the fear, like the absolute <laughs> terror. Oh, I've done all of this and now I might die. It's like I got that far completely fine. I was just like in the zone. But the second I realised that I could die, it was almost inevitable that I did so, and die I did. So, so, so can, we can we take a moment to like talk about how I, when I was very young, learned to ride a bike? Okay, yeah, sure. Okay, so. Have you I'm got a story time button on that board there? I, I don't, the unfortunately. <laughs> But, all right, all right. Story time. So, when I was very little, my dad was teaching me how to ride a bike. And in, in the council estate that we used to live in, there was like a playground that was inside a kind of circular wall inside um, um, between some of the flats. And what he would do is he'd put me on the bike and he'd run around with me going in that circle. And, and he'd let go and I'd be fine. I'd keep cycling, I'd keep cycling, I'd keep cycling. Then at some point, I'd see him because I got far enough around the circle to spot him and I'd realise he was no longer behind me pushing me along. And I'd think, oh, fuck, I can fall off now. <laughs> and I would. <laughs> so there you go. That's how recognising that things can go wrong can fuck you over. It's nice. Especially if you're like six. <laughs> that, is, that is a tale of this time. <laughs> Is, is that is that a different thing? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry, what, what, what did you say, Dad? I did quite. I mean that. just just that that is a tale as old as time, right? That's like everybody's <laughs> learning to ride a bike story. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Um. Anyway, another oh, game. Oh, you've got sorry. Else to I say did well. want to say yeah because I've talked about this arcade mode and it feels like I've given the impression that that's all it is. I mean, it is all it is, but. They've given like this huge number of different ways of interacting with the same number of worlds that you can play through. So it's not just that you can sit down there and play. You've got the local co-op mode. There's a bunch. There's like a massive page of things called feats, which are like these in-game achievements. And there's so, so many of them, like from doing levels in certain times to doing them without Cap without rescuing a single human to doing them while using a dash explosion to kill the bosses. Are there rewards for these feats? Um, I think some of them are linked to achievements, but the there's also a separate mode which puts you on different levels. And when you're on those levels, like there's a specific score target or time target or whatever. And in doing so, you get coins. And as you do that, you can unlock subsequent ones of these challenges, which will be other sort of like certain aspects or certain things to do on certain levels. But also the difficulty increases as you get higher XP because mm. you start on rookie. And then as you start doing it, you get more XP. And so the difficulty ramps up mm -hmm. for the next time that you play it. So yeah, there's actually like, I can see myself not just playing this until I've sort of done it on expert, but spending hours and hours and hours replaying it because it's that pure and there's that many options in there. So, I mean, that's more of the kind of arcade mentality, yeah. like giving you just more ways to, yeah, find find challenges in there that are interesting to take on. No, superb. You can tell superb. the game knows it's good when its reward is giving you more game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Should always be the way.
Okay, um, so um, we're going to go in a different direction now because, Jay, like, you were talking last time about the fact that you've started playing mobile games. Yeah. Right, with, Ma- with Magic Art Jump. Yeah, yeah, I have. And I've decided to make it a little mini project of mine to, uh, like, try and uh, gain some sort of understanding of a whole genre of video games that I don't understand. It's like I know, a whole platform. Yeah, it's a whole more platform, than a genre. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, video games. But see, this is this is the point. I don't understand that. <laughs> But yeah, so I'm 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 kind of trying to do this like what's good. I'm going around asking people that I know saying what's a what's a good mobile phone game, and the one I've been playing this current week has been Reigns, which is by this uh, small London-based uh, developer called Neural, but it's published by Devolver, so it was an easy sell uh, for me when I saw that. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, no, this is probably they put their probably, stamp of approval on it, probably, so probably going to be good. It's worth a game. Um, and what Reigns is. Is it's a choose your own adventure game, I guess, where you play a king who presides over a, uh, a over a, a country, and um, you basically swipe left or right to make choices. Yeah, <laughs> right. Okay. So, so, but your tr- but basically the way it's arranged is it, all the choices are on cards that are shuffled into a deck. Yeah. So, and as you and um, at the top of the screen, there are four resources that you have to keep balanced, and that's church, population, um, warfare, and money like your your treasury and you have to keep them balanced right because you lose and your king dies if either if any of them max out or if any of them like if the bottom drops out of any of them so you have to balance all of these things at the same time what is is the conceit for losing the game because you've got too much money (laughs) brilliant because all of the things that like you get you get part of the game is about unlocking the death cards to view them in the death gallery and every (laughs) every death of your king is like brilliant like there's this one where like I got like church got to maximum and they were like the new like they were like the new oligarch has kind of has, has risen up and they wanted to make you their straw man but the, but the church were like he's a heretic and they burnt me <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay tell me more this this actually right, sounds fantastic okay. Uh, so uh, basically, yeah. So you've got this deck of cards, but there are ten pole events that happen as you go through your kings. So in the year six hundred and sixty-six, I was visited by the devil who offered to like give me super evil powers if I like just ruined out my kingdom. And when you do that, it adds. If you say yes to that, it adds more cards into your deck permanently so there are these new things that can happen so every now and again you find someone like so, like an early one is a doctor will come to your like he came to my second king and then I was like yeah I'll recruit the doctor and then the doctor's cards got shuffled into my pack and now sometimes he comes up and he goes oh your urine smells like geraniums we should probably have a look at that <laughs> <laughs> and you can either say yes or no and your things will go down the interesting thing about the resources at the top is when you get asked the question you don't know which ones are going to be negatively or positively affected you know which one like what the damage is going to be because you have little circles above them and you can either get small circles medium circles or big circles so you know that that stat will be affected but you don't know whether it's good or bad you have to kind of make sense of the situation it's like if the church is asking you to do something and there's a big circle above them you know the church is going to go up yeah mm-hmm. but like sometimes like people will be like talking about like the, the, we'll go to war and like the treasury will have a big one the population will have a big one and the, the army will have a big one and you just know that two of them are going to plummet but you're not entirely <laughs> sure which one so you're going like am I going to take the gamble are, like, are we going to win this war yeah, yeah, this yeah war? exactly but it's also got really interesting things like there are like um, there are like jewels where you like go, you can like the people will come up and duel you, and they've got a little battle system about <laughs> swiping left and swiping right, and you can learn new moves and stuff. Um, yeah, it's really good. But anyway, the developers, their uh, their kind of their brief for it was they wanted to make a video game that represented the binality of massively important choices that our country believes in post Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> 
referendum on everything <laughs> and they nailed it <laughs> let's get Wayne's back and we've got straight back to Brexit <laughs> um, so so like it, it sounds it kind of reminds me of Hand of Fate a little bit um, which is um, I've, I've got on PC I'm not sure what else it's on um, but it's like a card game where you are at the end of the world um, playing cards with with I suppose Fate himself um, and you play the game and as you do you unlock more cards that allow you to get further when you play another game um, and it's really quite addictive but Hand of Fate's good like it's got a nice aesthetic um, and it's, it's interesting the way you're kind of levelling up as you're going through but it doesn't it never felt rich enough to like really hold me for very long but what you're talking about seems like it's got an excellent yeah, sense of humour wrapped cause, into yeah, that cause, I mean uh Alan has had a round of Hand of Fate, not mm-hmm. Hand of Fate, a round of Reigns. Yeah, yeah. I was like, Alan, check check this out at the pub the other day. Alan is a wise king. Alan <laughs> is the high score. He is not, he has lived the longest of all of my kings. So I like I like you know like crash and burn after seven years. Alan's like twenty two up there. Also, Alan's death. Was someone someone turned up and said, "Oh, I can I can you know help you with one of these burdens that you have." And it, the tr- options was get rid of the queen or get rid of the crown. And, and Alan was like, "Get rid of the crown." It was like Alan triumphantly walks away. Oh, <laughs> 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 the crown off, put it on the floor. And- <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. So he's raining. Didn't, didn't even lose. Didn't even lose. He's just like, oh, this is good. I've I've had enough. But um, <laughs> Alan, what did you think of it when you were playing it? It is. It's definitely. It's weird that at first thing you think like, oh, is there going to be like a Tinder aspect to this of just swipe left, swipe right? But then it's first, you know, you, at that beginning it's that, and then you think, oh, it's just going to be like yes, no questions or whatever. But then the questions start getting more interesting, and then the choices you have is just like, well, I don't. I don't know which one to do. So they, this sounds <laughs> this, no, but this sounds really excellent because we've got like the the use of something incredibly shallow, the the mechanics of mm. Tinder, to like <laughs> to to. to to kind of describe the, the brokenness of, of binary, yeah, <laughs> binary choices. So no, but but it's but it's using but it's using the mechanics to say this is shallow, and then to go. But actually, we're making incredibly difficult choices with this, which is fucking insane. <laughs> I, I I love this game, and I haven't even played it. Yeah, like I'm, I'm all about this it's now. It's really good. It's super cheap. You should all. How, I, how much is it? I, I have my like, magic. It's like like one ninety nine. I'm, I'm fucking getting it. Like, like I'm not even kidding. Yeah, I'm just there's like, no yeah, ads, no nothing. It's just it's just great and uh, it does have a cool aesthetic to it as well like the st- the design on all the cards is this very like angular simplistic style for all those different characters that pop up essentially that you meet and the it's kind of like it's interesting seeing the reoccurring characters like the soldier pops up and it's just like this big square metal helmet and red behind him it's like all oh, warning Oh, yeah. He's gonna ask you got, to do like, something this bad. Serial killer executioner that's somewhere in the deck <laughs> that's always asking you to just do bad shit. <laughs> but like it's really good. And also I'm about I'm about to blow the lid off this. Well there's there's more that's better. Disaster piece does the music. Oh, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck. Okay, yeah, no, I'm there's no two ways. I'm buying this. Um so for you if you don't know, Disaster Piece is the guy that did the music for Fez. Um what's the film? It follows. It follows as well. Um yeah. like wonderful kind of take on And Hyper Light Drifter. And Hyper Light Drifter on um like Angelis's like um music from um Blade Runner, but like with a, a more kind of modern take on that. This is his medieval jam. Hmm. So you want to see that? <laughs> For sure. Taste my game face. We are now going to have a little bit of a chat about Mass Effect Andromeda again. Um, obviously we've we talked about it a little bit before on the podcast, kind of forming some opinions with the opening parts of the game. Like, how, Joe, you you'd kind of got stuck in a little while ago. Yeah, you? I've played a lot more of it. You played um, a lot more. Of yeah, it. yeah. Also, so but hey, but, but now, Alan. You've completed mm-hmm. it, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm actually really interested because we've had lots of updates that have come around from the game being like kind of broken before, and like Joe's been telling me that there's some interesting things that the game's been dealing with. That means that maybe having completed it, you have a more interesting perspective than our uh, it's a bit jank view. Before. <laughs> well, I think it's just the interesting thing with the like it's a bit jank seems to just be the conversation about this game in like for the the public eye when it's at least from my perspective maybe because i waited for patches i haven't noticed 
any of that like if any jank so i mean do we want do you want to do like a quick what the game is or just pass on no 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 it's, it's, good, it's good to make sure that people know what we're talking about in case they've missed previous episodes so yeah. go for it so uh set 600 years after the events of mass effect 2 an organization called the initiative has taken thousands of volunteers from a bunch of different species to the andromeda galaxy to set up new civilization in that galaxy they've come to a small section of that called the helios cluster and kind of been met with a not only something called the scourge which is like a weird space anomaly that's fucking up space and but then there's also an alien race that seems to be invading at the same time trying to take over shop and it's and, still the same kind of like a third person action rpg yeah lots yeah. of leveling up but also really good cover based combat too yeah so the i mean i guess we're starting off with like the combat it's I think is the best the combat has been with in the franchise. It's managed to get better each and every time yeah. by a big step as well. So has it made that same big step between? Three well, it's just and there's um, from it does still remind me a lot of the combat with from Mass Effect Three, but I guess with a couple of little additions that do kind of open up flexibility with the whole thing. So you have there's kind of a a jump and a dash which sounds is one of those like a simple thing to add initially but then it does add so much to how dynamic the combat is and how much movement there is in the whole thing so you just be like dash between combat jump up hover while in midair shooting gives you like some bonuses sometimes and that everything is better with jetpacks yeah (laughs) every game has jetpacks now but the um it totally adds that just total extra element of maneuverability within the whole combat and added to the fact that the enemies constantly want to flank you and that is their their main goal is to try and get around the side of you if you if you add that extra element of of ability to move yourself making sure the enemies are are doing that back like it's Mm. it's going to make everything that much more more frenetic alan did you play sorry uh uh, i was gonna say talking about um talking about jetpacks for a moment i think i think there's something that's interesting that's going on in video games uh, with that regard because we are seeing them more and more and more we've got all of these like extra movement mechanics that are being added into third and first person shooters and i think it's the product of people just being very very competent with like those uh, twin stick controls for movement and aiming and now that they're adding in an extra layer to make sure that 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 there's more flow there to keep things more kinetic and i think i think it's well every, in almost every game that i've had that in it has made it that much more enjoyable so yeah it's nice to see that they're, that they're putting that into mass effect as well even though it isn't primarily a shooter they're making the effort to mm. make it work well as that yeah, yeah definitely what were you going to say Dan? Uh, Alan, have you played? Did you play much of Mass Effect 3's multiplayer? Yeah, actually, quite a lot of that in the end. Yeah, me too. Wait. And the, I, I thought the combat like really started to shine when I did that. And mm. I think the main reason I found it really started working was the way powers combined. And so I was wondering how in this game do they have that working? So like I remember doing like the biotic explosions or like the the well, tech, you, the tech. You, you weren't doing that in campaign overload. Because, like, seriously, that's that's how I made my way through that campaign. Mm. I was like, get everybody to use combining biotic power so that everything is exploding all of the time. <laughs> in purple. Mm, in purple. Yeah. <laughs> my favourite colour. I think the thing was, though, is in the multiplayer, I was actually playing as a biotic character, whereas I, oh. in, the, in the single player, I was, I was like the guy telling my biotic companions to do stuff yeah. and I wasn't the one doing it whereas in the since multiplayer the first was. Massive, since the first Mass Effect I made sure that I was like biotic with guns I've just, been Vanguard pretty much the whole way yeah, whole yeah, way through being Vanguard able to dash way. into someone's face and then shoot them with a shotgun <laughs> is, is yeah but, but with Mass Effect 3 you could get you could get one of your other guys to freeze them with biotic abilities and then you could dash into them triggering a biotic explosion which would send them flying and then you could just before they got too far away point blank them with a shotgun as well <laughs> Did you never have the, the power that once you blew them away, you could pull them back towards you and then shoot them with a shotgun? Fuck yeah, <laughs> yeah, I did. I was all over that shit. But I think that's an interesting thing with this game is the fact that it wants you to mix it up as much as possible because mm. you can. It doesn't necessarily limit you to any one chain of kind of okay you're going to balance your powers in biotic soldier you know or it's like tech 
was the was the the third one in this yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. They they have a uh, sort of a preset thing where you can essentially assign um, a a boost to your character that will give you boosts in one of those three or two of those three or all three and kind of split between them. And then each of those as well, you assign three different powers, and you can split. You can have four four presets logged at once so at any point during the game you can kind of go into your like pause thing like okay i'm gonna go over to um you know i've been just playing soldier i'm gonna flip over to um soldier plus biotic and then you'll have three abilities that you've set aside for that so depending on the situation depending on the types of enemies you're playing you'll be like okay right now i am fighting robots i need my tech abilities and maybe some biotic in there so as well i'm, so, I'm mm. so into this does it work like sort of loadouts <laughs> in a multiplayer game? yeah yeah totally but it's yes yeah, you do there's like three different loadouts but then because it's just the idea that kind of depending on that it's like the class you assign a class to yourself and then you add a loadout of abilities uh, but you can the game doesn't really because I don't think there's a level cap in the entire game. So you can feasibly max out every single one of your stats in enough time. Mm -hmm. So you can just be like, okay, I want to just put a bit in everything. Or yeah, I mean, I mean it, was, it, was, it was pretty easy. I mean, not easy to do, pretty, very achievable to do that in at least like Mass Effect 2 and 3. I can't remember with one, but like being able to max out, max out your levels was a thing that could happen yeah readily mm. so being able to like rotate through a lot more abilities like ha having additional flexibility i think that's like an interesting kind of design problem that you have in rpgs which is do you want to give players difficult choices so that they are f so that they have different things that they might want to do but they have to select a particular way they want to play the game or and i think maybe this is a better choice recognizing that in point of fact if you're in a particular situation how you are prepared for that situation at that time is in itself a choice so mm -hmm. saying that like you need to make sure that the abilities that you have at your disposal are the ones to most effectively deal with this like mm. you are still choosing to do that and they are still things that you have put experience into it and, and like the sound of this to me it sounds like it's adding more of that kineticism and like kind of speed and flow to combat that i always enjoy in any given video game so th it sounds really, yeah, really yeah. good i mean it still had, does have limitations in it in the fact like when you switch to a new one you have to wait for the ability to reload because mm -hmm. it doesn't i think it might end up being a bit cheap if you could just it, like no but you could just put the same one in every one and then you could just <laughs> use it nine times <laughs> well, no, no, so when you switch you you have to wait it kind of yes. resets the whole but if it, if you didn't reset it then yeah. you'd just be able to use it nine times in a row right yeah it's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's quite interesting because that's a weird um, design choice in context, context-wise for the game. Like just being able to switch on the fly and become biotic, or like that, really kind of breaks the sort of the world they've set up. And like I think other games get around this kind of thing by having um, different characters that you can then use. So like in a JRPG, you have different specialist characters and they have different abilities. So I wonder if. <laughs> I don't know. There I is wonder, a, does there that is feel a, like a, it breaks there's a stuff in Mass Effect? There is a narrative conceit for it within yeah. the game. Like but there you is run in Mass on Effect. This, oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, there changing. is in this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you run on a, uh, you kind of, um, you're running this kind of AI that has this interesting effect where one of the aspects is the more points that say you put into biotics. Like for me, I take biotics and soldier abilities. Mm. Right, and so the more that I put into both of those, wait. So basically, you're still a vampire. Uh, yeah, ba yeah. But basically, the more I put into those, the more it um, levels up my um, vanguard trait. Which, uh, but the vanguard trait it is now a uh, is now kind of a, uh, I guess, like a thing that gets attached to a class that gives you boosts and bonuses. And uh, and the more that the more points that you spend, the more you kind of level that. Up, so your Vanguard level goes up to to a, a like you know like level five or whatever, depending on the more the more points that you spend. Whilst your like you know your innate level, they, those two things aren't the same. It's like you're leveling up the classes themselves, right? Okay. Which is really interesting mm -hmm. and a new thing for the franchise. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and it's it does it as you're saying it adds that extra element of kind of separate things that you are leveling up at the same time just by 
you know depending on the class that you're putting into but you you do still dan you do still have the the characters in your team will still be like one of them will be a vanguard one of them will be a soldier mm, yeah yeah and so that you'll still have that as a backup but i think that's i don't know, i found myself more picking the characters i will I wanted around more for the scenario than in previous games, I think, rather than how they would help me in combat, which I don't know for some people might, that might not be the right thing. But for me, it was just like, okay, I'm going to see a bunch of this, like the technology of uh, old, the remnant people as they're known. It's like, I'm going to bring along the the girl that studies remnant because she's probably going to say a bunch of funny things. Yeah, I mean, right, in the yeah. original trilogy, it was just like, I'm going to take Tolly and Garrison and everyone else can get fucking bonded. <laughs> <Damn. laughs> fucking right. And like, and to, and to be frank, that was for like combined reasons with the fact that like they were just... The best characters. They, they were the best characters in terms of like their, their writing and how they interacted with you, but yeah. also in terms of what they could bring to the table in, in combat. Yeah. Like, they, they was, it was a synergy yeah they work yeah. well together I mean, so yeah i mean for me it's always in this one there's uh yeah like an asari um called pb that i tend to bring around on most of the missions and then the krogan i can't remember his name now though is it Drac? Drac? yeah Drax. Yeah. yeah he's he's good fun yeah he's, like really an good. Old he's really grouchy well krogan. Written. one of the really nice aspects as i've pushed f- like further through the game is the incidental dialogue that you get between the characters when you're taking different ones out on different quests mm. um changes depending on the biome that you're in on the different planets what you're kind of standing in front of but it's um it's been made that all of the characters have different interactions with each other so they're kind of talking about themselves you're kind of pitching in a little bit as well um and that stuff's happening because there's a lot of downtime where you're driving from place to place but it's really nice to kind of hear the different ways that the kind of the lots of banter dialogue that there is plays out between the characters and yeah. I, I, found, I found that to be like surprisingly entertaining. it's like it, it's a that, I mean another aspect of who I was picking to go on was kind of like oh I kind of want to build up the relationship between these two people yeah and then because you will hear that their conversation will continue over the course of the entire game and evolve and you can like sense that there is sort of a relationship building between them just by the conversations when you're driving around and so they, they oh sorry they do I'm, this is love one last yeah. point they do uh, they do like one clever thing where they like they kind of know what where they're at in their relationship conversations there's something that's running in the background so it's like occasionally like it's not they they won't just bark a line like sometimes they'll be like oh when you talked about this thing can you tell me more about that because as a scientist I am interested in hearing about this and then they'll be like yeah sure I just love of kicking the shit out of dudes this is what i do you know <laughs> like I don't, like it's interesting like it, it is interesting the way that they log that stuff and alan's right mm. it does make you f- even though there's no stat and there's no bonus it does make you feel like you're developing your crew's personal relationship in a managerial role you're like these two need a bit of time let's get them out there <laughs> does that affect anything except the dialogue or is it to enrich the experience or is there any sort of payoff in the gameplay for this no i've noticed but I mean, as a separate thing, um, the the quests, the character-specific quests that you get for your team from Mass Effect 2 are back in this one. So that's, you get kind of a, the, the separate thing of going on, you know, as you build up the relationships with your crew members, you will then unlock different quests that you can go on and that builds up your relationship with that character and you do get a bit of payoff in that later in the game. Okay. But yeah, apart from just the how how the conversations play out in the van they there's nothing you know that doesn't add to anything but it's still just a nice extra element for when as joe was saying you spend a lot of time driving around in this game from point a to point z you know and it's you know like having that kind of extra bit of entertainment while you're driving around definitely adds to that that aspect of it i I suppose that's like the big question for this then because you've seen most of the game because you've seen all of it and joe you've seen a lot more of it like and this is the big thing that Mass Effect always was previously for me at least how is how are the characters and like does the plot arc feel satisfying yeah that's what I wanted to ask like having played like a lot more of the game now like previously we were quite negative about it but it seems like we're quite positive about it now but the thing that we haven't really discussed is the the kind of the the real central plot and I don't want to I obviously don't want to spoil it but what I do want to know is has it come together does it does it feel like it's a good and interesting game now and do 
as as Dan has just said, do the characters hold up beyond these like interesting bits of conversation that happen that's um, happening between them? Alan's going to be able to speak to it a lot more than I can, but just to throw a little bit in, I think some of the topics that are being engaged in in Mass Effect Andromeda are interesting because it's effectively about you guys just rocking up into this galaxy and just starting to be like, yeah, we're here now and we're doing this thing. And there are other people that live there and have always lived there. And there are these kind of weird quests and quest lines and stuff that revolve around things like cultural appropriation and things like that that are like themes that are aren't really explored that much in video games and they've really tried to do there's a lot of lines where you're trying to work out whether or not you you're, whether or not you're like educating or whether in the act of educating people giving them that technology you're taking away from their own cultural heritage and things like that it's that kind of like you know that kind of like you know Spanish arrive in like you know South America kind of thing you know and it's like how much like you know the damage that you can do here just by not thinking about your decisions and benignly like thinking yeah well obviously this is good because I'm giving them something maybe they don't want the like things flu. That, yeah <laughs> you know? and like maybe you don't, maybe they don't want the things that you're giving them maybe that takes away from their culture maybe they're just not at that yet and they have things that they do better but it's all about whether or not your character can see that Oftentimes, I've found in in the, especially the sub quests. See, that's excellent because Bioware has kind of been pushing this trend of being more about like the interesting social issues in terms of like the diversity and yeah, like attempting to represent more races and sexualities and things like that in their video games. That they've taken it so much on board that they're now like dealing with some. I, subtler aspects of that same universe and something that hasn't been really dealt with in video games is yeah really encouraging I mean Alan does that continue through it, the game I think it's one of the things it does to a degree it's not I don't think it's at the forefront of a lot of stuff maybe just because of the, the fact that I you know for my dialogue options I always just say yeah do you think it's fine <laughs> well <laughs> but this the there's definitely that aspect of just different people have different needs and not trying to choosing as a character do you want to dictate to people how they should be or do you want to let them give them a bit more freedom to act as they they would want to or as what's best for them not just even in the kind of the alien race but then i don't know if you've met the the rebel group yet no, Joe. I don't think. But I there's have. there's a group of guys that they they it's talked about a lot early on in the game where the splint a, faction yeah, from the Nexus because the this idea is that all of the different ships that arrived um, in Andromeda all were sort of came at different times and you've got the arcs the words one for each species and then you have the main place the Nexus which is essentially the citadel for this version of the game for people that know the other ones like the main hub that arrived early and then people are essentially with everything that went to shit there a bunch of people rebelled there was a mutiny and they've gone off to make their own settlement on a planet and dealing with them is a big part of a, one of the chapters I guess of the game of you know kind of not realising that yeah just because they're not playing exactly by the rules doesn't mean they're villains and kind of you know I'm trying to think about the way, best way to say it but yeah just that they they're you know you can it's okay to let and leave them do their own thing as long as you try and build a relationship with them it's not you know you don't have you know i guess even the choice of do you want to forcibly try and rejoin your rejoin your group or leave them to what they're doing and try and more become friends with them and deal with it in that regard but i, th I think overall story-wise from like the overarching plot it is very uh like derivative of previous mass effect games just in the idea of like you've got an ancient alien race that has technology that you're finding and using right but they still do it in an interesting way and a, a, a way that I, I still found engaging for the whole thing to, to the point where it's like i don't really i wouldn't want to spoil like the last third of the game and the discoveries made there because it's <laughs> it's like interesting enough and there's some like scenarios towards like the very end of the game that i've really enjoyed but kind of to the point where I, with this game it's something where I find it really disappointing that it's got such negative press when I think it's a great game. Well, um, I was going to actually ask about this because obviously yours coming at it from, you know, post the number of patches, post release. I mean, I don't think that the negative press came out of anything other than a game that 
wasn't particularly complete when it was released. Mm. And I mean, I mean, would Bioware, for example, be able to get away with putting another game on pre-order now? Uh, it's something that is good. I think that negative press. At least I've not played it in either mm. form. But if there, I, I think we should move away from, or we should perhaps call out developers that are going to release unfinished products, particularly in this world of people pre-ordering games and scheduling around certain release dates. I, think, I actually think stuff. it's I actually think it's an, uh, an EA problem in a lot of ways. I think that um, they are, they have such a specific schedule that if a game is not done within that schedule, they don't they don't have a choice about it. It just has to be out. I think that I think that happens often with their games they end up having the and it's, it's maybe it's been happening more lately they end up with like a, a core of a game but then they end up finishing it after the fact adding in those extra bits after the fact now I'm, I'm not saying it's just an EA problem I think it's happening more and more in video games in general but it's pushing me to not want to get games on release and to wait a few months to make sure that all of the bugs have been ironed mm. out I mean <laughs> For instance, and I think I mentioned this last episode as well, Dishonored 2, like, I didn't pick it up for a few months and that meant by the time I did it actually worked on PC when apparently it hadn't worked very well at all before. Um, but, Alan, there is there is a question I wanted to ask. Like, seeing as you've completed and, uh, Mass Effect Andromeda now, um, about how long did it take? Oh, it's really fucking long. Yeah. Because, yeah. <laughs> like, <'cause> like, <laughs> kind of talking about the the opening parts before being feeling a bit generic and the fact that you've got stuck in and found more interesting things as, you, as you've gone further in. Like, I... It's it's a barrier to entry if you are having to play 20 hours of a game before you're getting to the good stuff. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the way the structure of the game is built, it's in such a way where I probably spent a good 20 hours longer playing this game than I could have if I just powered through some of the main points like just the fact that when you go to each of these planets wanting to do as much of that each planet had to offer before moving on to the next one whereas I could have jumped through the main plot probably easily in like I don't know under 20 hours mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. uh, no, okay. but there is a lot of I mean, there's a lot of good stuff just in terms of exploration of each planet and the missions that you go on there. And they said the character missions do with your crew. But then there is also, like, I guess one of the downsides, there's a lot of busy work in terms of, like, scanning planets, which seems to be, like, a, a staple with Mass Effect <laughs> of, like, good, there are lots of solar systems, but then each one, like, majority of them that you go to, it would just be like, scan that planet, scan that planet, scan that planet, bounce. And that's, <laughs> like, that is a there's a lot of that so unless you're a completionist like me that wants to see that 100 percent on every solar system <laughs> you could most of them you could not bother visiting you gotta get that element zero there right oh yeah so <laughs> that for your, yeah for crafting because there's crafting as well in the and game the, but i found I, in the early portion of the game even up to where i am now like i found the barrier to like resources versus crafting the, the insanity D mm. does that continue on that high threshold for the whole game or does there come a point where they start giving you the stuff well I mean I I was trying to just okay yeah, because I was being like super thorough and just going to every single solar system and like scanning which does give you materials and then also doing a lot of like one of the things you can do when driving around on planets is mining and you could essentially like you will come across a little area dump a little mining drone and it will yeah i found it. that fucking i was imagining yeah, people hanging not... out of the back of the thing with a shovel <laughs> <on a> bag. <laughs> if only it was uh, yeah so i mean but that's one of those things where it's more that that is total busy work that you yeah, don't need yeah. but even just as i was getting later and later into the game even just kind of destroying the stuff I had previously crafted to get materials to then oh, be able to okay. build the new stuff was helping a lot. And like just finding all these random pieces of armor, destroying it all so I could just build the nice new Pathfinder armor was like how Wait, I kind of it, got is through it. it. Still, is it still like it was in Mass Effect 1? Do you like break down your equipment into Omnigel for it to be turned into absolutely anything? Omnigel was one of the things. <laughs> <laughs> Only one of the things. Yeah. But hey. Yeah. Um, I don't know. So... But it sounds it sounds like we've kind of shifted our opinion to something more positive about Andromeda. Then, I mean, I at least as far as I'm concerned, I think it's a great game. There okay. is a lot of they saying there's a lot of busy work in it, but it's busy work that can easily be avoided if you just want to pass through the main story. And it's you know, 
I think all of the characters are really well written. The crew themselves are cool. I mean, I played as a, as far as like voice acting goes, I think a, most of them are great. I think there's one or two of the crew that I find a bit annoying, but for the most part, I think they're great. I was playing as the the male version of uh, Scott Ryder, and he just sounds exactly like Nolan North. <laughs> They've just got a, a spot on Nolan North impressionist to play that character. So it's just like, yeah, it's Drake in space. Um, space Drake. Yes. That's pretty sad. Though, That's just it? Firefly. Yeah, this is really sad. It's like, oh, what do we does this game need? We need Nolan North, but it's quite a lot of dialogue. We can't afford that. Yeah. All right, what we need is a Nolan North sound alike because there's actually, there's it's more profitable to be a man that sounds like Nolan North than actually come with your own voice <laughs> to video yeah. game voice actually. In. So fucking. But I think just described Alistair McGowan's career. I mean, it's. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's just. I mean, from what they've done with this, they've found that it's like a guy that not only is like a good, you know, like a good know the North sound alike, um, but he's actually a good voice actor as well. And like the Ooh. performances that he puts forward, and each of the kind of the the conversation options, rather than just being kind of like you know kind of you're saying the good thing or the bad thing or whatever it's more like you're going to say the snarky thing the intelligent thing the heartfelt thing or the very like cold calculating I, thing i so. found even playing it in the same similar way as i did the first mass effect i found like rider to be just a fairly more jolly dude than shepherd ever yeah, was yeah. like rider's kind of like this is great we're in space we're in. yeah <laughs> like whereas shepherd was like oh we're gonna kill all of them <laughs> <laughs> wait jay i know i know you read the uh, mass effect one novel as well oh fuck that trash that, 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 that fucking that bin people yeah but like but like as a kind of setup for what it was about it was all about like, <laughs> this is the grim hard version of being in space it was we've watched 24 and we want to make our sci-fi opera about being thuggish in that yeah, fashion yeah. <laughs> so like, yeah um, so I can kind of understand that they'd like make it um, that it would have been a, a lot more serious and that maybe people will want to have something that's a bit more jolly now but talking of spin-offs won- to video game od- uh, odds and ends although oh, one more on. point before going just save for anyone that does want to try it out as far as I know like at the point of recording they've just uh, released like a, a trial of the game I think on consoles and PC where it's like the first 10 hours for free so mm. you know if you like the sounds of this game give it a go <laughs> Man, I had that was such a good take, and like, and yeah, that, that was such a fucking said, deep. Cock. I didn't even. Like, I've, I've you, got tra- <laughs> you trapped me. You, Alan, Alan, yeah. Alan interrupted that seg, but you trapped me in that seg. I know. Like, yeah, I was, I was lost. I was lost. Joe's still, still just. Amazing. Amazing. I was still there. I was still, <laughs> still there. Waiting I, for that. I didn't have it. Re- I, I, it I, was I getting that. I should have. I should have brought that up first. <laughs> so, like, so I apologise, podcast listeners, for like ruining the flow of what could have been a beautiful seg. But now we're going to talk about another spin-off thing for another video game. Um, because because we've all had a look at well maybe not all of us because you haven't Wayne no I haven't you... I'm just going to sit here quietly for a bit <laughs> okay <laughs> that's alright I quite enjoy doing that I've had a, I had a really busy first half yeah you so did you, you, you just, were just, chill. just but, yeah, chill for the rest of it sit right. on the bench <laughs> 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 But um, yeah, is someone so, going to get struck down with like you know I don't know what, what do they call them like some sort of larynx injury and I've got and to come and pretend them. I know about what we're talking about next <laughs> I my voice is giving up wait <laughs> wait take over tag in tag you're in you're going to have to <laughs> scribble down your thoughts on so it so you've got, you've got to introduce a segment now Wayne have I got to introduce yeah, a segment on. okay then so you can, then you can take a uh, do I, can I do the segue as well can, no 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 <laughs> the, 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 the third time we tried the segue it's failed like we, we have to give okay, up on it now okay um, so on um, so on Netflix there's recently been a uh, the release of a anime yep it's um, an anime an anime related to or spun off of the video game Castlevania and yep. everyone but me has watched it so guys um, who's going to give this the well Wayne do you want to take a knee and then we'll... <laughs> <laughs> who's going to give us the elevator synopsis I'm going to go to Dan good choice oh, okay okay as someone who has only played one Castlevania game the same this... one as me yeah this uh, anime is a story of <sighs> essentially Dracula getting pissed and taking out demon vengeance on humanity that is such a wonderful summary yes and one man kind of bumbling his way into possibly being a person to try and stop that is this pissed as in short for pissed off or is he literally on the vodka um, no, he's he's annoyed. Um, the hero he's, of the piece. He's, he's a bit more than annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> the hero of the piece. He's he's the other kind of pissed. He's he's yeah, just yeah, drunk. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So we've got all bases covered here. Um, yeah. So pissed on all fronts. 
<laughs> um, so it's yeah, yeah, it's it's a quite a credible anime. Um, I think like Netflix, like when it comes to making their own series, they they want to bring a level of quality to them that like is is just pretty solid all the time like even if even if it's something that's more kind of stupid and comedy like they still want to make sure that it's given its dues here they're doing an anime so they're doing a proper anime um mm-hmm. i think just like dan i've i've only played uh castlevania symphony of the night so my kind of understanding of the anime in terms of how it fits in with the the rest of of what castlevania are about is is kind of limited but what i got from it was a yeah just just a pretty decent anime that i enjoyed watching but i think maybe there's more to it that that can be uh the, the people that have played more of the games will be able to get stuck into okay like um so this is like an anime retelling of castlevania 3 dracula's curse on the nes right Tra- uh, castlevania 3 dracula's curse is the prequel to the first castlevania Okay, so this is kind of like, this was the starting point of the timeline up until Lament of Innocence on PlayStation 2, which is the true origin story. I, it's another one of them timelines, isn't it? Castlevania. <laughs> it's one of that time is timey why me. <laughs> it's fucking old video game timelines. Like, it just, the, the longer they've been around, the more the convoluted more, and twisted the more they crazy. can get. Before they were brave enough to number thing zero as well, yeah, to yeah, make yeah. clear that I this mean, one was not, a prequel. It's not as, uh, as confusing as the free Zelda timelines debacle but like it's it's getting there Um, but yeah so this is a story of Trevor Belmont now the interesting thing about um, Castlevania 3 was uh, it was the first game that let you play as multiple characters and so you could play as um, Trevor you could play as Alucard uh, Alucard yeah um, Cypher or Grant, who seems to be missing from the anime As so, so far. far. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but um, I so like I'm so you know like bets are off on whether or not he's gonna he's gonna make an appearance. But they travel their way through the countryside of uh, Transylvania, battling all of uh, Dracula's army, getting to his castle and uh, trying to put him down once and for all. But what they've really done is they've kind of. <laughs> brought a lot of bits of Castlevania lure together. There's a lot of stuff that echoes things that happen in Symphony of the Night. Yeah. Um, Because I I don't really want to... I don't really want to ruin the plot of the anime because it's happening at the moment. And honestly, I'm not a massive anime guy. Like, I mean, I can appreciate one every now and again, but, like, the last thing I saw that I thought was good was, like, Death Note. You know, so you can take away my uh, my anime credentials along like, like, left I'm, behind, left I, in a bar I go, somewhere. I go, like. I go back further than that. I'm like Samurai Champloo. Yeah. So, you know. yeah. In terms of Death Note being one of the last great ones, there's a lot of old anime fans that feel exactly the same. Oh, okay. So it's okay. kind of so yeah. so Maybe you're more schooled than you realize. Yeah. <laughs> maybe I just got out at the right time. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like I think um, the animation in this particular series is fantastic, mm. and the um, I think it really harkens into a real kind of older anime spirit like something that's Mm. a bit more akin to a ninja scroll or like a berserk because like the violence is like insane there's not yeah. there's not that much of it though but which when I really it like. is there jeez no, but, it <laughs> <good. It's laughs> but it's not it's not doing that thing that anime sometimes does do which is go here you are going to watch this so you can see the fight it's it's like we're gonna put everything in place so that you're following how you've got all of this leading up to what is obviously going to be some serious combat <laughs> but we're not just going to throw that throw that at you every episode like and Frankly, the com- the combat is fucking fantastic. Like mm. the, uh, uh, this is like my repeating thing. This episode, the sense of kineticism in it <laughs> is like <laughs> on on the fucking money. Like it just it has that feel that of of like good combat in animation that you, that only fits in that space. Like you, mm. it just ah oh, yeah, but also it's <laughs> fucking over though like so quick which yeah. is really good I mean there's one big drawn out fight in the, in the four episodes but all the other fights are like some guys rock up and it's like bang 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 <laughs> oh you are you're fucked up now <laughs> like you shouldn't have picked that fight <laughs> the, um, I think the choreography is really good as well like the certain there's one fight in particular that I'm thinking of where it's kind of like swapping between defence and attack and then different weapons that is like Again, it's another like short sequence, but it's really, really satisfying. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Um, 
I would I would say I had I had like a little bit of a, a kind of problem with it, which is that it felt it felt rushed. Like it felt that the the kind of the time that they could have spent building up atmosphere like didn't exist there. That every time there was there was like a note that they could have hung on, they just like jumped straight to the next one. Well, it's a gamble, though, isn't it? Like is, this is such a short. Like, is this a viable thing that we can do? Mm-hmm. Luckily, mm-hmm. like critics and fans have like rolled out, and the numbers are there, and um, and the critics have roundly praised it because, by anime standards, I think like the characters are pretty well developed. Like Trevor's excellent. I think it's an interesting thing with this, maybe like a slight side note, but maybe a conversation point, I don't know. But just this like Americans doing anime better than Japanese studios at the yeah, moment. Yeah, I mean like um Korra was yeah. Legend of Korra was like amazing. Yeah. Actually, so fuck that. That's the last good anime that I've seen. <laughs> but then is it though? Because it's not like well, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, it's not yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I mean I get but then is this an anime? I mean that's, oh, weird. that's confusing Japanese fucking Japanese animation soup, like as a portmanteau. Japan anime is, is, is Say it like you are Otacon. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> If if it's if, if it's not to Japan, is it? <laughs> 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 Um, um, God, I've completely lost my train of thought now, Dad. God damn. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, no, but I think I think that um, in terms of the the quality of the animation they produced, it's it's kind of been a problem that I have heard about in anime for a little while. And may, maybe you'll know more about this, Alan, because I'm not like I'm not anywhere near people who are necessarily on the pulse. But as far as I understand, if somebody makes a good anime, they get told that they need to make one that's that more people are going to watch, but with less money. So there's just less and less money to make the animation. So we end up with more series that are just using old footage over and over and over again without being able to like build interesting plots. Yeah, I mean, I've I've kind of stayed away from a lot of the modern anime, just like watching bits and pieces, but not really being that interested, mainly because it's becoming all the same. Mm. And there's a lot of character archetypes that are just like, you, you can watch one episode and guess the plot of the entire show just based mm. on stuff that you've watched before. And... The actual animation itself has, in my opinion, for a lot of anime from Japan, has gone really downhill. Yeah, and I think that's why. But it's not even... I don't know how much of it is from stuff being reused. It's it's like a... It's a lower budget, but then a heavy reliance on using computers for it. But then it's like something as weird as like perspective in anime from Japan is absolutely terrible these days. Mm-hmm. Like when just there's been whole articles the, written about like how the scale of this scene makes no the, sense um, whatsoever. The, the biggest problem like I, I've had with a lot of things and if you go on Netflix and look at the other anime that's available even some of Netflix's own you can tell it's CG from the from the pictures the, mm. the screenshots of it even when it's not in motion and obviously CG looks terrible in motion like if anybody's seen any of the recent the sort of revamp of Berserk even the movies like that came out like a couple of years ago like the CG animation in that for the fighting and stuff looks awful like the frame rate's too high it, and it just messes with the way heard, like anime um, action is supposed to look. I heard Attack um, on Titan was pretty good, though. Yeah, it, Attack on Titan does the clever thing, and I think Castlevania does the same thing, where it CG animates the background and they hand animate the characters. Mm, yeah. And and the problem is, is when you hand animate the characters and they're going through all these motions, and if there's too many, like, and this is the weird thing, like, if there's too many frames there, it looks weird. Yeah, it's the it whole, doesn't look right. It's the whole fact that people felt weird about having uh, the Hobbit being filmed at fifty frames a second rather than normal twenty four. Right, like we have an expectation of how that looks, mm. and if it's not being done that way, then you don't have any valid. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Right. That's they, speaking of, they also speaking like of dynamically the Hobbit. light. Like when it's CG anime, like they dynamically light and obviously it's only a few colours. So it's like really jarring when it like, I don't know, there's something really gross about 3G, 3, uh, CG anime to me. <laughs> yeah, speaking of The Hobbit, the two of the main characters in it are voiced by people from The yeah, Hobbit. And, and you know what, they sound fucking great. Yeah. Like yeah. they sound like, honestly, like fuck, I've forgotten the name of the main character. Help me out here. Uh, tre- uh, Trevor. Like the, who, the, the person that's uh, playing R- Richard like, Armitage. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. This is good. I don't remember names. Everyone else can remember them for me. <laughs> I just um, remember the he's, character he's named really... Thor and Oakenshield. <laughs> 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 but he's he's really really good. Mm. Like in mm. 
in doing anime dialogue, which it doesn't translate. Which is hard. Translate. Yeah, yeah, like it's a different thing because you have to know when to put in your your little, <laughs> you know, and you're like, mm. <laughs> like, you've got all these noises that you have to use. But yeah, even like the guy that um, the guy that's playing Dracula was another one of the the dwarves from his crew, and also <laughs> is was the villain from Uncharted Two. Yeah, it's Lazarevich who's playing Dracula. Yeah. 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 No, I think I think I mean, like I said, I I rather enjoyed it. I felt kind of uncertain as to if I thought it was excellent, but I I was I'm very very happy to watch more of it. I'm glad that it seems to like really fit in with all of what Castlevania is supposed to be about like, as mm. somebody who doesn't have a clear idea of what? of what that is necessarily one of the things I really appreciated in it is it didn't exposition dump like the world it really oh, did the right. thing like where it just it just showed you what was happening and then you kind of got inference about what was going on in the world it never did the thing where it was like oh in a world where demons and Dracula have existed for lots of years like it, <laughs> it never does any of that it just shows it just you what's happening in. and you infer the rest although and I thought it did that really well although every now and then when it's done right I do actually really enjoy that yeah, yeah some, sometimes it's really satisfying it can be like a proper hype moment like when it gives you that that kind of quick scene jump like exposition dump thing but like I, I really appreciated how this you just got introduced characters that shone light on new aspects of the world that you didn't see before and I thought it was really good in that aspect as a Castlevania mega fan I, I can say that I, I see this as a fucking gift <laughs> like I loved every single minute of it and was really surprised at the quality of it mm. and as someone that's massively invested in the series the fact that they've like there's a lot going on with Castlevania at the moment like um, they've just like released all the soundtracks of the original games on vinyl and like the cover to uh, like uh, Dracula 3 was weird and anime and I was like what, what's, what's going on here and then boom I'm confronted by the anime that that was the <laughs> art style of but I mean it, it was a really arty take on those models so it's not stills from it you know it was an art piece of all of the characters intertwined into one and like I was like this is weird though I don't remember ever seeing any art of cars that looks <laughs> like that and then blam there's the series go watch it and I'm like and it's a really interesting game and it's a really it's the flashpoint of the series this is where they can from here they can build off if it's successful I mean you can you can blast happily all the way through to Symphony of the Night from here mm. sweet yeah, yeah, so I know. can have all of the story of the games that I've missed without actually having to play them yeah which is uh, the bit of a shame if that's how you're going <laughs> to I was, I was waiting for you to like... as, as a matter of fact in celebration me and Alan have completed Castlevania 1 this yeah. this very week oh fucking eight I record the footage as well so like you're gonna get to see me like cheese deaf <laughs> really badly cause I cause I was, by that point I was like fuck we're getting through this bad boy <laughs> sweet so god bless the, safe states I mean, on, safe states on the anime itself like it all sounds like it's got a very pos- positive review does this mean do you think this will lead to more in the Castlevania universe i.e. it's leading into They've that or is this season. Or is this also an experiment in the idea of porting video games more generally? Do you think is this is this perhaps the lead into doing that? Well, they've well, actually the same the same person because I think the producer on this is a guy uh, probably butchering the name, but Ardi Shankar, I think is the name. He also um, one notable thing that he's done he did like an R-rated Power Rangers short online oh, a while guy? back. Yeah. Oh, the, that that R-rated Power Rangers short that had Katie Sackhoff in it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Got he it, made yeah. that, but his kind of he's he was the executive executive producer on this kind of main creative control of it, even pushing to have it be anime over live action because I think Netflix wanted it to be live action. They well, said no. He, he was definitely doing the right yeah. thing. Yeah, but he's also they're doing um, an Assassin's Creed one now as well. Essentially, off the back of the success of that, this he's not only getting another season of Castlevania, <laughs> but then also doing yeah Assassin's Creed spin off. But, but then they <laughs> have to somehow have something interesting to say in Assassin's Creed, and that's going to be really yeah, that's going to be that is going to be a challenge because like it would have been great if it was just like old video game franchises, like you know if they were like yeah, so we're going to do another one. Double Dragon. <laughs> Be like, fucking, yeah, let's go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, then they could have gone for the fucking full on eighty synth soundtrack yeah, and yeah, it'd been great. got disaster piece in again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I want Frogger the fucking anime. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm thinking Mega Man would be good. Bring back the Sonic animated anything. Mega Man, it's an awakening. Actually, it's it's an awakening. Amazing, <laughs> I, think, I think Mega Man is something that I would like to see stretched out with something. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, Mega Man's had them in the past, though. There's so. some nice lore behind it, isn't there? As well. Yeah, like, and he's had bad animes in the past. So yeah. like, whenever, like, I, I think there is another bad. Mega Man TV show coming. Oh yeah, yeah, isn't there? yeah like horrible CGI one. Yeah, do Mega Man X. Yeah, I want to watch a really high budget like like robot man fight a robot penguin. That would be fucking <laughs> sick. <laughs> yeah, it feels like it needs to be directed by Paul Van Oven though. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> but hey, all right. Anyway, I think we've got a good podcast here, so time to wrap this one up I reckon um, so um, I have and yeah wait no I'm gonna I'm gonna say again before before we do that little wrap up if you like this episode recommend us to a friend we do really appreciate it and like share us on whatever social media you're involved in if if that's your vibe um, with that said I've been Azizi Adiemo I've been Wayne James I've been Joe Knight I've been Alan Heath I've been Dan Slauson and that was episode 55 of Taste My Game Face. We'll catch you next time. Bye bye. Taste My Game Face.